Welcome to Back to the Father, a show about the journey of life focused on our final end, which is God himself, our loving Father. And now here's your host, Dave Palmer. And welcome everybody to this Friday edition of Back to the Father. We were off last week, uh, but we are live here today. We have a very interesting and un bit unusual show to share with you because we don't really have a specific format, okay? We're going to talk about, uh, generally speaking, why do we study St. Thomas Aquinas? What is so special about mystic philosophy? And we have been very blessed this week to have Adrian Fonseca from our Houston office, host of uh, Catholic Drive Time, to be here in the Dallas office because they're doing a lot of renovations down uh, at the KSHJ studio in Houston. So he's been doing his show from here. And uh, Cecil is out. She's out on retreat. And so we asked uh, Adrian if he would come and be on the show with us. And even though he's done with his official duties uh, for this week, he obliged and said he's here. And he's a big time Thomist. He loves uh, Aquinas like I do. And so he is over there. Hi, uh, hi Adrian. How are howdy, you? Howdy, howdy. Praise be to God. It's good to be here. Yeah. And so we also have William Kirkendall, who's our wonderful uh, high school senior homeschool intern and has been doing this for over a year now coming here right yeah, probably la- well last well, june yeah. yeah last june so uh thanks for being here uh, as well of course. and uh all right and we also welcome i guess members of the cdt team the the real faithful catholic drive time viewers and listeners i think adrian just sent out uh, a text to you so we hope you'll uh, participate and let us know what's on your mind as well so uh, yes, Annabelle just joined us. Um, good morning to you, Annabelle. Lori on Facebook, good morning to you. And if uh, you'd like to comment, then uh, any questions, comments, or concerns, soapboxes, negativities, positivities, or anything in between, leave them in the <laughs> chat below, and we'd love to get to them. Can I brag a little bit about Annabelle? Of course. Okay, so Anna, I've been doing over the last 24 weeks this uh, once a week kind of like lesson on the summa so in 24 weeks we went through the whole thing i would send out like a 35 minute video and then there would be a live uh you know zoom meeting on tuesday nights and then there'd be a quiz that they could take as well well annabelle and her husband jim went all the way through the whole thing whoa okay so she studied the entire summa with me and her husband jim wow. how long did it take and uh 24 weeks 24 weeks yeah. hey, you did the whole weeks. summa in 24 weeks yeah yeah wow well of course not every article but uh, uh yeah so we did the whole thing just kind of like what i do when i teach the high school students but i just did it for adults you know in the evenings Impressive. well then i would put a quiz on and almost everybody who takes this quiz well, like the first time they'll get a 60 and then they'll get maybe a 75 because they can redo it. And then they'll get an 80 and eventually, you know, you just keep redoing it and redo it until you get a hundred. Annabelle had this interesting knack where almost every single time, the first time she took the quiz, she got a hundred or, or maybe a 95 wow. at, at the lowest. And so I think Annabelle has a, a real good sense of grasping to mystic philosophy. So, so that means we have to be very careful what we say. <laughs> about her, yes. No, I yeah. meant about oh. to mystic philosophy. Oh, She's going to okay. catch she, us. She, she, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, she said, I'm an expert now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. She, yeah, she, I guess she kind of, to some degree, is. So I've got an article called, Why Do We Study St. Thomas Aquinas? I was going to read some of the excerpts from that. But uh, any, you know, just kind of general comments from either of you before we get going? Um, no, not really. I think, uh, it's Thomistic philosophy is very important and it's a field of study that has been lost in recent times, but it's making a revitalization in the recent time period. And I don't know if you caught this and you're sure you talked about this, um, that they, they're celebrating St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Vatican is, and you can receive indulgence um, by celebrating. What I forget what the rules are. I think it's like go mm-hmm. to a Dominican uh, priory or something like that. Which there's um, one There's one about two miles from here. Uh, I mean, well, we can walk there. Yeah. <laughs> During the show. Yeah, pilgrimage. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll yeah, live stream from a phone. St. Albert the Great Dominican Priory. There you go. It's on the campus of UD. There you go. Which is, uh, did you know UD was real close to here? I could see the tower from the, yeah, from the window. Yeah, yeah. someone yeah. was pointing it out to me. I think Cecil was telling me. She mm-hmm. said she tells her brother, climb up the tower and wave at me. It works. <laughs> I know you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Yeah. So uh, anyways, William's been doing this for, like we said, uh, since June of 22. And, a little over a year. Uh, yeah. What, what has uh, kind of learning Aquinas and some of these things and philosophers, how, how has it impacted you? I think it's <clears> – I. I would say it really has helped me to understand a little bit more about philosophy and get into it more because before I, before I came here, uh, philosophy wasn't really something I was big into. Like I was big into current events, following news, all that stuff. But 
not really the philosophy of all of it, but by being on the show and talking about it, I've really gotten interested in in the Summa, in philosophy, in political philosophy. I still hold that St. Thomas Aquinas is one of the greatest philosophers the world has ever seen. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested to, yeah. to learn about it every week. And, uh, and a lot of the more secular materialist <laughs> atheist philosophers uh, really dislike him. Yeah. I think probably in secular colleges and universities, uh, there's probably a great animosity towards him. Yeah, they typically, it's not even animosity. It was what I've noticed is, what it, is they kind of just brush over him. Mm-hmm. They, they'll include yeah. him. They'll go over the entire medievals in a day. And they'll include St. Thomas as one of them and be like, he came up with these uh, five proofs and uh, we, we very much debunk those now, but uh, moving on. And that's better. Actually. Yeah, but even in even among, uh, you know, Catholics like uh, the Cistercians, for example, mm. we have a Cistercian yeah. you know, school and monastery very close to here. And I've, I've talked to some of them. In fact, I had some of them as my teachers when I was taking classes at UD. Mm. And I definitely got a sense that they were not as a whole really big on Thomism. Is there, I mean, they're, they're based on St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He was the founder of the Cistercians, right? Correct. Uh, is there any reason why Clairvaux and Aquinas might have uh, bumped heads? I think Clairvaux mm-hmm. lived earlier than Aquinas, maybe a century or two, right? Wasn't he like the ten hundred, the, the thousands or so? Off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But yeah. the the dominant, so the when you look at the history of uh, medieval philosophy, uh, Thomism didn't take off until maybe a hundred years, maybe a little bit more after Aquinas' death. Um, obviously, his greatest defender was Albert the Great at the time. But the um, the dominant school, even though in terms of um, its influence, Thomism had a lot of force. The Franciscan school actually was the dominant school purely because the Franciscans far outnumbered the Dominicans in terms of the amount of um, places they were and number of members of the Franciscan order. And so the Franciscan theology actually was m- more widely present, even though Thomism was more uh, prestigious in its, in its um, presentation. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. I, I would guess that the majority of religious orders would have been Thomists. I know for a fact the Carmelites were Thomist. But I don't know about the Cistercians. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the time of Thomas, you had Bonaventure, who was a great Mm -hmm. Franciscan. Of course, St. Francis of Assisi himself lived uh, shortly before Aquinas. And uh, then you got the guys like Duns Scotus, who was a Franciscan. William of Ockham. Ockham was a Franciscan. And uh, some problematic stuff coming out in the centuries after uh, Aquinas, which I I still, the more I study, I I think Occam, man, he really set philosophy in a whole different direction with all this nominalism Mm -hmm. stuff. So anyways, uh, if you're out there and you want to join the conversation, you know, Dr. Peter Craig says... We know you're out there. We know you're out there. If you want to comment and let us know what's on your mind or maybe why is Thomism attractive to you, uh, or why it's not attractive to you. Why it's not. Yeah. Now, you know, one thing I'm learning as I get a dig a little bit deeper into Thomism is that, and, and jump in and either of you and comment on this, is that uh, Aquinas very much uh, is about reason, right? As was Socrates, right? Would you agree? And there's, there's, a, there's a, another strand of Christianity that has been much more focused on the will, mm. God's will, and uh, and I don't know if you would uh, call it what is it voluntarism or mm. and uh, of course Nietzsche was all about the you know the, the 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 will but even among Catholic circles there seems to be and and do you know what I'm talking about where there's maybe of course they're both important the intellect and the will but when there's an overemphasis on the will that tends to be problematic. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, not really. I think because, you know, I'm thinking of what St. Thomas, his uh, famous advice to his sister, who was a, um, who was a nun, um, when asked to write a treatise on how to, be, how to get to heaven. And he wrote back to her uh, the treatise. And whenever she received it, he was, she was impressed by how quickly he had written back. She opens it up, and it's one sentence. He said, if you want to get to heaven... Will it? And that's what that was he, from Aquinas. That's from Aquinas. And but the the idea is, we wh- what does that mean? Okay, it means that you set your will on your desires. It's kind of the same way that Saint Augustine says, um, "Love God and do what thou wilt." Because if you are willing to get to heaven, if you're loving God, then your will will be directed towards keeping the commandments. 
And that's just necessarily that goes together. It goes with the gospel for today. Um, the first and greatest commandment, love God with your whole heart, mind, and soul. Um, and if you do that, then you're, and it's necessary that your will is directed towards that because you can't love if your will doesn't move the affections of charity towards an object, right? Yeah, I think, you know, now that I think about it, I think it was either Duns Scotus or William of Ockham who taught that God could change his will and will something differently than what he wills now. Like, mm. and, and this, so this is where it falls into like the moral order that, you know, they, they would say, for example, well, you know, he did order people in the Old Testament to, to be killed. And then in the New Testament, mm. we're not supposed to do that. And so it's kind of like a, a changing will is what um, where where I and I think Martin Luther because that'd be up a violation of divine simplicity. Yeah, I think Martin Luther picked up on this as well because he was a big fan of Occam, uh, and there seems to be this 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 strand of people that and the, uh, there's got to be a name for it where the, the like the the whole plan of God is not in place. Like there's some some changeability where God mm-hmm. can will something a, a hundred years from now that He doesn't will now. You know, whereas I think. Aquinas would say that that's not possible. Yeah, you know? that's that's classic. That, that's, that's um, the problem. That's classic Islam. Uh, yeah. the, the Muslim belief of God is that He is pure will, and so because of that, that means that He is um, whatever He wills. And he can he radically is will. So whatever he he can just decide whatever he wants. And so Muslims will say things like um, God wills that the heretics remain heretics. Mm-hmm. Um, God wills that you you be enslaved in this way, and we would say that's not true. That's not the case because God can only will what is good because he is, God isn't will. He is goodness, truth, beauty. He is being, he's being qua being. And that makes it his, um, his, as, as being simple, it makes his goodness, his truth and his beauty synonymous with one another. They're the same Mm -hmm. thing. And so he cannot, but will what is good, true and beautiful. It's why we say in the act of faith, uh, we believe all that the church teaches because it has been revealed by God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. And I think that's a, a, a great distinction between a Catholic understanding of God and a Islamic understanding of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, William, any, any thoughts? Uh, no, I, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's uh, I think that's very interesting. I didn't, I didn't think about, think about that before and uh, how that was, uh, how it was like an Islamic belief, but um, but yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's it's all it's all objective, and yeah, God is you know uh, truth and goodness and beauty, and right. it all makes sense. It's almost like, like you, the, the the Muslims, perhaps, if you're if I'm reading this right, can kind of like separate the will from the rest of God, whereas like you say with Aquinas, it's all the same. Mm-hmm. His essence, his being, mm-hmm. his intellect, his will, his everything. You know, it's all the same. His existence, it's just yeah. one thing, and that's hard to get our heads around because it is pretty complicated for us. You know, yeah. and that was like the Richard. Dawkins, right. the quote that we were playing. I don't know if you listened to Catholic Drive Time this morning, but it's it like was. Never. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's Catholic Drive Time? Uh, uh, yeah, there's a quote where this, you know, very bright. You know, I don't. I, don't, I guess that's a good question. Can you be a bright atheist? I, I don't know. Yeah, because I mean, you miss the most. Can you be a wise fool? Can, yeah, the. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most the full says in hearts there is no God, right? You're right. The most fundamental question that you should get right. If you get it wrong, you know, because a lot of people will say, "Oh, you know, that Christopher Hitchens, he was a really, really bright guy." You know, but yeah, can you be bright and be an atheist? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so Dawkins in the uh, soundbite that Adrian was playing this morning was saying that God can't be simple because he basically has to do so many things. He has to answer so many prayers. He has to run a world. He's got to, you know, he just couldn't get his head around the fact that God's simplicity would be inconsistent with, in his mind, all the stuff that God has to do. You know, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. But um, anybody commenting? Yes. Uh, Monica <laughs> says, hello, just joining. What did I miss? Nothing yet. We're just kind of all over the place. Uh, let's see. That's Annabelle the first said, 17 minutes. That's what you missed. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle says, God wills our good and he wants us to surrender his good and perfect will to his good and perfect will. Amen. Annabelle. So true. The, uh, I think the big aspect of this is that we recognize, I, I, I don't know. Um, I talk about this on the on the radio occasionally, um, and I think I brought it up this week. One of the prayers that I make is that I desire to desire God's will, mm-hmm. because sometimes I 
I know that I want to want God's will, but sometimes I want my own will. Like I'm thinking about something and I'm like, I really just want to do what I want to do, but I want to want God's will. And that's very difficult. And because we recognize, um, I'm thinking about Our Lady, like, let me do, let me, not me act, let not I act, but Our Lady acts within me. Let not myself love Jesus, but let Our Lady love Jesus within me. Uh, let me be transubstantiated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, as Max Kolbe would say. Um, it's something that is uh, very much, it's difficult. It's easier said than done. <laughs> it's like, kind of like when uh, Thomas Aquinas' advice, um, if you want to get to heaven, will it? Uh, easier said than done. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that, you know, the, the section of the Summa about grace is really interesting because he asks questions like, can a, can a sinner be reconciled to God without grace? That's mm-hmm. pretty obvious. No, it's not possible. I mean, uh, you know, can you know any truth without grace? And that one is uh, really interesting because we have a natural capacity to know truth, but without like an initial grace, we wouldn't even be able to know anything. And then he, then he has a question like, can man uh, like prepare himself for grace without grace? And even then Thomas is like, no, no, you can't. So it's like God always takes a first step, right? Yeah. And uh, which almost seems like, okay, I can't even do anything. So if I say, God, please, you know, give me the grace to, to be holier, then you'd have to assume, well, my, the, the very fact that I said that mm. was because God gave me the grace to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. right. And that's, right. it's kind of strange because it, it, how does that jive with free will? Because if I couldn't do that without God making the first move, in what way was that free? You know? Right. right. So answer that smarty pants. Uh-huh. Yeah. I would, I always say, um, in my prayers, uh, thank you, God, for all the good that I've done. Thank you, God, for all the good that I've received. And I'm sorry, God, for all the bad that I've done and all the bad that I've received, uh, because I know uh, the good is from God and the bad is from me. Uh, and I think that's that's something important that we recognize because we would like to, in our own human nature, um, blame God. And we'd like to blame God for our, our woes um, when in reality, God is good um, in anything that is that is bad in the sense of, um, of sinful is obviously it has to be from us. Now, obviously God can send us sufferings as testing and things like that. But in terms of things that we do, that it's immoral. That's us. Anything mm-hmm. that we do that's good. It's only from God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah God, as I was learning in my, uh, in a Thomistic psychology class, I'm taking at our, our local co-op. Um, uh, I was in yesterday uh, the teacher said that, yeah, God is God is all good, and the definition of evil is anything apart from God, or sorrow, or anything like that is anything that's taken away from the good. It's anything that's not good, so therefore... Like a privation right, of good, right? right? Exactly, yeah, yes. Yeah. yes. Which is, uh, yeah, the whole thing of, you know, God I, identifying himself as I am, which, you know, means that God's essence and his existence are the same thing, so he's like perfect being, and I think that the the Thomistic, uh, and I think he, I think Augustine also touched on this as well, where the evil is just a privation of being. Mm-hmm. It's a, like doesn't have any being at, at all. You know, right, it's right. just like God never created it. Right, yeah. because then you'd have to say God created something bad. But right. it's just, uh, it, it's it's kind of hard to get your head around because yeah. it's a, you know, but it, it seems like a real thing. I mean, I mean, it know, makes sense. Like you think of um, of like darkness. Well, I guess um, what is this? See, darkness is. Is it all light or is it no light? I forget. Yeah. Um, yeah like it yeah, takes sure. in all the light and then there's, uh, that becomes there's darkness. Dark. Yeah. yeah. And um, you think of a hole, you dig a hole and it's removing all the things. A hole is not actually a thing. Mm-hmm. It's an yeah. absence of the dirt. Yeah, that's, right, a, good, that's right. a good, that's um, a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. And so we think about our, the moral life. It's like a, the, a evil, a viciousness is not, um, you're not, gaining it you're losing virtue and the more virtue you lose the less human you become so our lady was the most human human because she had all virtue right so let me read a paragraph from this article here it's called why do we study saint thomas aquinas he says um, i don't even know who the author is to be honest with you one of the, <laughs> uh, but it's all it good me. it's all good you did it okay i'll take uh, one of the main tasks in the evangelization of culture is to conform the mind of man to the mind of god all right, which is interesting because it didn't say, and again, I'm not trying to pose mind and will against each other, but it says the mind of man to the mind of God. This entails that we should have the mind of God. We should have the mind of the church. Thus, the main goal of our intellectual formation 
is to conform ourselves to the mind of the church. This necessarily requires that we should arrive at the certainty of truth founded on the objective reality of things. All right, so that, that's a, a, a pretty good stuff. Benedict XVI describes our world today as a collapse of civilization that seeks for the truth, uh, that seeks for the truth due primarily to the self-limitation of reason, in which the ephemeral is affirmed as a value and the possibility of discovering the real meaning of life is cast into doubt. Relativism has become the central problem for faith in our time, for we are in a cultural situation that exalts exalts subjectivism as a criteria and measure of truth. Okay, that's pretty good stuff. Yeah, and I mean it's so it's so true for society yeah. today. Yeah. There's so many people that when Benedict was alive, I I, I never I never read <clears throat> much of Pope Benedict XVI. Many people said he was like maybe the, the one of the greatest philosophers. I mean theologian popes we've ever had. Did you get into um, reading Pope Benedict XVI much? Um, I read quite a bit of of Pope Benedict, but uh, you know, one thing about Benedict is the change in Benedict over time. I think that's interesting because, and before he became Pope, he very much he did he very much it was very clear that he didn't want to be Pope. He wanted to be a theologian, and you you kind of see early on. He was a part of the uh, the Nouveau Theologie uh, crew, which was a very bad. Um, Gary Goulagrange, yeah, Bal- 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 John Bal- Bal- yeah, Bal- 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 is a is one of the major players in Nouveau Theologie. Um, Gary Goulagrange wrote an amazing, amazing. Um, I don't, I don't, I guess it's a book uh, called "Where Is the New Theology Leading Us." And it's actually been recently republished by a professor at the University of St. Thomas, uh, translated. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is whenever he became pope, Benedict realized that he had to put aside the new theology and have a return to Thomism. And he even articulates that I had to go find a source for remember where specifically he said this, where he basically said something along the lines of, we got bored with Thomism. So they, it wasn't that they realized that Thomism was wrong or was not suited anymore. It's that because Thomism is very simple. I mean, there's parts of it that are complicated, but in general, it's pretty straightforward. It's all very reasonable. It's very clear. And we've, for people who study it the way they do in the, in the, in the scholastics and the schools, you study it systematically. And it's been commented on by all the great commentators for 800 years. And so they were bored. And they wanted to test, they wanted to do new things. And so they create this nouveau theologie. So I think it's interesting to see Benedict and his, uh, once he became Pope, realizing, or actually really when he became Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, he realized, I need to return to Ritomism. I need to return to what is sure, what is stable, and I can't play theologian anymore. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I've always thought of him as being Augustinian. Isn't doesn't isn't that how he identified himself? And uh, what would you what would you think that means if somebody is more Augustinian than uh, than Thomist? Yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Father Martin, who is a Augustinian priest, and he would tell me he goes um, he says um, this whole distinction between saying that you're an Augustinian or a Thomist is silly because Aquinas was an Augustinian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Um, and right. so he it kind of <clears throat> makes the point that there's really the distinction is more of a distinction of Aquinas, post-Aquinas, is basically taking Augustine and keep moving forward. People who try to say to go to Augustine and stick and stay in Augustine is kind of um, climbing down the shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm. But but Augustine was much more platonic, and right. I, they, they don't even know if he had access to Aristotle mm-hmm. you know, when he lived. And then, um, of course, Aquinas comes along, and lay, who had access to both Plato and Aristotle. And Aristotle was not, you know, the, the church was didn't want the, the theologians to really be studying Aristotle, but Aquinas still did. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, you, you sometimes wonder, what would a, a, how would it have changed Augustine if he had had access to Aristotle? Yeah. You know, what difference would that have made? But he, he definitely latched on to uh, Aristotle. Uh, Martin Luther was an Augustinian priest, and I don't know if that means anything. You know, you said you have a friend who's an Augustinian priest, but I don't know any Augustinian priests. Hmm. Is it an order that is worldwide? Are there, is it still a thing? So Augustinians are not like um, Dominicans, where Dominicans, 
have a single master general, and that's kind of what they're in charge. Augustinians traditionally were associated with um, with canons, and so they were attached to a cathedral or a church, and they grew up around them. And later in later times, Augustinians tended to become um, other orders were, were Augustinian in the sense they followed the rule of St. Augustine. And the Augustinian order uh, kind of died out a lot. There's been uh, kind of thinned. It was very much thinned out. Um, they still exist today throughout the world, um, but there's not a one central authority that is like, a, this is the master general of the Augustinian order. Uh, it's more similar to that of the Franciscans where there's like a billion different kinds of subsets of Franciscan. You have the CFRs, the OFRs, the um, the... Uh, Franciscans being immaculate, the all these other ones, they have tons of them. Same kind of idea with the Augustinians. They're kind of independent, autonomous kind of things. The the interesting thing about Augustine, I find, is you know Augustine would I guess officially be in the early, early Middle Ages. Uh, so you had Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and what three four hundred BC, and then you have the Epicureans, the Stoics, uh, you know the the Sophists around the time of of uh, Socrates. And then you have the beginning of Christianity, uh, and Augustine comes, what, about 400 or so? And then maybe 100 or so years later, Boethius. And then for a long time, you don't really have anybody, do you? I mean, you, you have Augustine, Boethius. I mean, who were the philosophers between Boethius and, say, you have, uh, uh, Peter I mean, Lombard? How, yeah, okay, Lombard, but he yeah, was Lombard. just like a century before um, uh, Aquinas. Aquinas, right? Mm-hmm. And you had, um, 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 oh, gosh, Abelard, mm-hmm. I guess, before Aquinas. And you also had Anselm, mm-hmm. and who would have been like maybe... Uh, 300 ten, years? Yeah, I'm not, sure, not too long. But there was a big, long... I bet you there's like a five, 600-year period where... Is that why they call it the Dark Ages? I mean, they're like, who, who, or were they just There's like, no man, we're, names. We're, yeah. we're content with Aristotelian philosophy, or did it go dark? Or I just, I find that period approximately maybe like 600 to 1,000. Yeah, who, I who, think. Who are, the, who are the philosophers? I think uh, the, the main problem is, is that Aquinas is such a shining light uh, of that time period that he overshadowed uh, basically everyone else in the surrounding time. Um, including his fellow Dominicans, because, for instance, Albert the Great uh, only became known, he was only canonized a hundred years ago. Is that right? And, yeah, he was He was very unknown, very unknown, and yet he was a professor of Aquinas. He was studying Aristotle before Aquinas and all these different things, um, different fields as well, many, many fields. And so uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of anybody, but I could almost guarantee that there are a ton of philosophers that we just don't know that kind of just been lost to history because Aquinas just overshadows them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of happens uh, post. Like if you go through, uh, can you name me the top five Dominican theologians from post Aquinas to like 500 years later? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like could you yeah. name five? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, because it was just all Aquinas, right? They're all they're relying on Aquinas. And uh, yeah, interesting. So... All right, well, this is Back to the Father, and uh, I have a doozy of uh, some trivia questions that we're going to ask in about 20 minutes as we close out the show. I'm going to pit William Uh against Adrian, okay? Uh And William's younger than Adrian by about seven years. 20, oh, sorry. Uh, No, no, not 20 years. (laughs) And so I'm I'm going to ask him the easier questions and Adrian the the more challenging questions, but it should be a lot of fun. Uh, If you want to comment about anything that we're talking about, it's just kind of a round table, scatter shooting kind of conversation. I like this kind of stuff, you know, just kind of to talk and stuff. And uh, and feel free to jump in, William. I know uh, Adrian and I both like to talk about a lot, especially myself. But uh, (laughs) any thoughts so far? um, Not not really anything that you guys haven't already said. Uh, Yeah, I, I think the I think the whole history of philosophy thing is very interesting. You know, you have Plato, Socrates. Plato, Aristotle, those big ones, and then the Sophists, all of those, and then and then yeah, you hit um, you hit Aquinas, and then even even you know centuries later, you hit you know John Locke, and you hit William of Ockham, and Descartes, Descartes, yeah. and all of those, all the, uh, and um, Blaise Pascal, and all of those other other philosophers, uh, Nietzsche. I think I think the whole uh, the whole history of philosophy thing is very mm-hmm. interesting, and to really compare 
the modern ones to be uh, to the ancient or the medieval ones and to really see, yeah, the modern ones have really have really had a I feel have really had an impact on society today. The society is kind of following more of their philosophy, not so much the philosophy of what you would have heard in the Middle Ages or in the ancient in the ancient period. I mm-hmm. think that the way it's all played out is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it's been lost. Yeah. Uh, let me just read this paragraph real quickly. It's talking about the the attributes of Aquinas and what makes him uh, somebody that we really should take seriously and study. And it says, realism and objectivity. Realism is the main feature of Thomistic thought. Its prevailing characteristic is that it is always in search of truth. It is faithful to the voice of created things, which builds the edifice of philosophy and faithful to the voice of the church to construct the building of theology. In in Thomism is, so to speak, a sort of natural gospel an incomparably firm foundation for all constructions of scientific inquiry because Thomism is characterized primarily by their objectivity. Theirs are not buildings or lifts purely abstract spirit, but buildings that follow the real momentum of things, never decay the value of Thomistic doctrine because to do so would have would have to decline the value of things. Okay, I know that's kind of worry. That actually was a couple of quotes from Pope's but uh, realism is something that is really interesting. And I have a hard time because, you know, I teach high school kids talking about realism and universalism versus nominalism. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, when you, if you look at the, the bad philosophers of the last, you know, six, seven hundred years, they almost all are nominalists. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at the good philosophers... The realists. They're, I mean, would you say that there's a there's a demarcation? Uh, yes, for sure. Because I think the the main the main thing, especially when when trying to explain realism to um, to high schoolers, I would say, you know, realists are basically the p- position that we can generally trust our senses. Yeah, and that's I mean, simple as. Whereas the anomalist position is basically we cannot generally trust our senses, and the universalist would pretty much agree with the realist. They're, they're very similar to the realist. Uh, they just think that we trust our senses, but it's actually directing us towards something that's beyond um, the physical world. Yeah. Um, so St. Saint Aqu- uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, recognizing as a realist, seeing that you can actually perceive things and then draw knowledge from what we perceive. It's very much um, the opposite of the way angels work. Angels um, take in knowledge immediately. We deduce knowledge. So they think uh, discursively what we think deductively. But angels would have to be realists because otherwise there's oh, nothing there. Oh, of course. There. Of you course. Know? I mean, because an angel, they, they can't be nominalists because they wouldn't have anything to place a name on because they can't see anything. Right. right? So they only mm-hmm. see reality, by way, by see intellectually, right? Right. And it, so, yeah, I never and thought about that. And it's important because if, because we, if we, can't, we can't reason if we can't trust that things in front of us are what they are. Because how could you deduce, for instance, if I say, um, if I look out the the window and I see a a green car with uh, bumper stickers in the back driving up to the studio and I look over, I can now deduce, okay, oh, Sissel's coming in because, okay, that's a green car. There's bumper stickers that seems to have the GRN stickers. Let me deduce that. But if you're a nominalist, you can actually make that leap because who knows what that is? Mm -hmm. Literally, it could be anything. Um, but it all seems, you know, like when I when I try to explain it, it all seems like, you know, who cares? Well, you know, it just all it all seems kind of like nonsense. But I know what you're trying to say, Adrian, is it actually does matter. I mean, yeah, have, it, have you learned anything about that? Oh, yeah. Realism and yeah, nominalism? Can, yeah, yeah. It, I think I think a lot of what Adrian said really ties into what I'm learning about in rationalism and empiricism. This idea mm-hmm. that we can that, you know, the rationalists will say, well, I can I can know that this thing it like for example i can know gluttony's wrong i don't need to experience gluttony or experience someone eating too much to know it's wrong i can just use my mind to know that but the empiricist view is more of well i have to i have to see it to know it i think there's definitely a truth Mm -hmm. to both the the, rationalism and empiricism as far as as far as i know is a rather modern modern idea of how we get knowledge in epistemology but it, it is it is definitely it is definitely something, uh, something very interesting. Yeah, that, uh, it sure is. The one, uh, one real quick. Rebecca says howdy from Midland. Good morning, howdy to you, Rebecca. Hey, Amanda Rebecca. says good afternoon. I'm um, good afternoon, Amanda. Um, so, 
it's interesting you brought that up because the have you ever heard this because okay we're talking about let's bring this into practical right people are saying oh why do why does this matter who cares um have you ever heard this phrase no uterus no opinion no uterus no opinion they're talking about right, and like the, men have no opinion they, they, so, not, i'm not going to listen to you if you don't exactly yeah, so right. you're a man you can't give an opinion about abortion because you don't have a uterus mm. um so why why does that follow explain to me why does it do i need a uterus in order to have an opinion about abortion it doesn't follow but if you're falling into these bad philosophies you might say oh well, yeah you the only knowledge you can have has to be experiential um and so it goes in so far to like when it goes to this um they talk about god oh god must have experienced evil he must do evil because that's the only way that evil can exist because he knows it now we can know it intellectually without knowing it experientially is the point the same way you would say a surgeon doesn't need to have gone through those surgeries in order to do surgery on you uh these intellectual knowledge the it is not necessarily tied with the experiential knowledge and i think that's something that has to be kept in mind uh, one other point uh, kind of going backwards so something you had mentioned earlier about the um cistercians um i could find cistercians but leo the 13th and eterni patris says quote it is known that nearly all the founders and lawgivers of the religious orders commanded their members to study and religiously adhere to the teachings of St. Thomas, fearful lest any of them should swerve even in the slightest degree from the footsteps of so great a man. The statutes of the Benedictines, the Carmelites, the Augustinians, the Society of Jesus, and many others all testify that they are bound by this law, end quote. He didn't mention the Cistercians. He didn't mention the Cistercians, but <clears throat> yeah. um, he did mention the Augustinians. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that I've always thought the yeah the pitting of uh, Augustine against Aquinas for the reasons you explained is that uh, you're not going to read the Summa for more than about a page without getting a <laughs> quote from Augustine. And Thomas yeah. is very reverential towards Augustine, and uh, a couple of times he disagrees with him, but you can tell he hates to do that. Yeah, I think he does. He does the same thing with Aristotle. I mean, he calls him the philosopher in the, mm -hmm. in the Summa. So yeah, similar. yeah, sure does. All right, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, I've just, you know, spend most of my time just digging into this stuff. And I think, uh, I don't know, we ought to have more of these conversations. Yeah. I think uh, there's not enough conversations about just uh, what does it mean to be a human uh -huh. person, yeah, especially in light of our relationship with God, our relationship with uh, other creatures, uh, the angels, what's the difference mm -hmm. between, you know, angels and man and I think, uh, that yeah, kind of stuff. I, I think philosophy is a really, really interesting subject now that I've gotten into it because the people who aren't into philosophy as much or don't really think about it at all, you can't, in my opinion, you can't really think too deeply about where we've come to as a society if you don't really know the background of how we got here. Mm -hmm. I mean, philosophy has a huge impact on on society. The the modern, like I said, the modern philosophers are, are um, in a certain way, uh, controlling society by by what they by what they wrote and by what they taught in their in their philosophy so i think really knowing what how we got here today and who uh who did all this is is really it's something really interesting to think about and i i just find myself thinking about it all the time just in my free time just really dwelling on it yeah i wish i was when i was his age <laughs> to, you know actually having a conversation like this i would have been nowhere i've told you that many times yeah you know um what you are both just said there reminds me of um, why I dislike the field of psychology. I dislike the field of psychology because psychology literally should be the study of the soul, the psyche, the soul. Uh, but it's not uh, because most of psychology is based off false philosophies. And if you teach them false philosophies, there's no wonder that people are all lost mm -hmm. and the these these psychologists are trying to they have a worldview a they have their own anthropology a freudian anthropology really and then they try to say okay i'm going to fix you but their idea of fixing you is conforming you to a freudian uh, man mm -hmm. and this is the same thing that we would say like if you're an engineer if you're a bad engineer and your idea of a building is one that's not structurally sound and you're like, oh, I'm going to construct this building. I'm going to fix this building. But your ideal for a building is an unstable building. Well, whenever you try to direct it towards that, what's going to happen? 
it's going to collapse. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of doctors. If a doctor says, oh, a properly set foot is one that's crooked 70 degrees off. Well, then when he tries to set your foot that's broken, you're going to have a, more problems. Mm -hmm. So man goes to, he has issues and he's trying to seek help and he goes to a psychologist. A psychologist has a false anthropology. And so when he's trying to fix you and try to set your, your mind right onto proper <coughs> anthropologies, what's happening? They're breaking you and sending you further down the wrong road. Mm -hmm. And so philosophy is very important. Anthropology is very important. It's, it's literally life or death. People commit suicide on outrageous rates. And it's mostly to do with having a false anthropology and a false idea of the world and false ends, not knowing who we are and where we're going. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Have you done my study on Carl Jung, the archetypes and all that? A little that? bit. Yeah, interesting stuff. Mostly uh, the Wolfenstein's lectures. Yeah, it's uh, there's there's so much to learn. You know, phenomenology. Uh, what uh, you know, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> no, John, John Paul II uh, considered himself a phenomenologist, he did. right? Yeah. Uh, Edmund Husserl was the a a. I, I think they they call him kind of the the founder of phenomenology. And interestingly, his student was Martin Heidegger. Mm -hmm. Husserl was a Jew. And the, the, he the, he was pro, he was a teacher of a university in Germany at the time that World War II broke out. Well, Martin Heidegger <laughs> ended up, I think, taking his position. Husserl got fired because he was a Jew, and then Heidegger became a Nazi. Uh, and, and now Heidegger, you know, obviously has some faults. You know, uh, <laughs> fell into Nazism. Now I don't think he ever apologized uh, throughout his life, but he he wrote some interesting works on being. And uh, just existence, and I, I actually would like to read some Heidegger. There's like a, a whole lot of stuff I want to read, you know. Yeah. I think Thomistic uh, phenomenology is a contradiction in terms. Oh, is that right? Why I so? think so. Why so? I think because uh, realism and phenomenology don't go together. I think mm -hmm. phenomenologists um, they take the what they see, and instead of um, conforming the mind to reality, but then also conforming the uh, reality to the faith, they say, okay, whatever I see must be what it is. And so now you, you err too far in the, in the opposite direction. Cause like I said, uh, the realist tradition says that your senses are generally reliable, not always reliable. And so if I say, Oh, Hey Dave, your shirt is pink. And I actually see a pink shirt. Mm -hmm. Well, my eyes are messed up. I'm colorblind. I'm something's wrong with me and I need to conform my perception to reality, even though I may be wrong or phenomenologists would say, well, that is your perception. Therefore it is what that is. Um, and it goes, then it goes regards for that, for the faith as well. And so I think that, um, Thomistic phenomenology is a contradiction in terms because it, it violates realism. Hmm, interesting. Um, I know Peter Kraft, and this is going a little bit off that topic. Peter Kraft says that what needs to be combined is Thomism and personalism. Interesting. And I, I don't know if you know exactly what he means by that. What I think he means, you know, the, 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 the if you read the Summa, it's kind of a, it's a system, right? It's, it's a way, that's the way I see it anyways, is a way uh, to come to know God and how to, uh, you know, live, uh, live a, a, a virtuous life and, uh, gear, you know, direct all things to our final end. But I think what he means by that is inserting the individual person into that, uh, that that you know, matrix or that that framework, I guess you can say. But it's interesting. He said that a couple of times. Um, do you, do what? What do you what do you think of when you think of personalism? What what is is that a a, a brand of philosophy or what would you say that is? I don't know. How would what do you mean when you say personalism? Yeah, that's why I'm. Uh, I, I I think personalism. Uh, it, it it probably would be related to existentialism. It's uh, seeing things through the, and, and I think phenomenology might have some overlap as well, but seeing things from the perspective of, of, the, indi humans. of, of the individual yeah. person. Um, and, uh, you know, because... It's a, opposite a, a, of wisdom. Aquinas doesn't say in the Summa, well, you know, what you need to do is you need to live a virtuous life. You need to, fi you know, do right. this. He's, he's not, it's not a manual of how a person should live. Right. He's laying it out there as a framework and just saying, you know, this is what God is. This is the Trinity. It's very, it's, it's you know, I don't know. It's, if by personalism you mean the, a position that basically is a pregenitor of um, phenomenology, then I would say that personalism 
is cannot be reconciled with Thomism because it's the opposite of wisdom. Uh, because wisdom is to see things from God's perspective. Uh, it's one way to put it that's very simply simply put, uh, to see things through God's perspective. Uh, another way to put it is to, is to see through a Catholic lens. And by a Catholic lens, I mean a universal lens, to see everything according to the whole. But an individual person has to have wisdom. You, you, right. know, you and I and, and, and William are not like, I, I guess, in a sharing a wisdom is mm-hmm. that I, it's my objective to become wise and it's your objective to become wise and Williams right and so in that regard yes you, you know wisdom is important but I need to personally become wise well, but right? that's not what personalism is though yeah uh, I don't know because that, uh, because personalism isn't that isn't that you personally need to learn something it's more um, seeing the world through the human lens. And it doesn't really regard. It's not. It's not so subjective that it's like the individual person. So it's like it's not you and me and then Dave. It's humans. It's persons in general. Okay, how does a human person perceive things beyond itself, and how does it relate to the human person? But we want to see things objectively, not in relation to us. But uh, but but um, somebody like Soren Kierkegaard, uh, you know, his gravestone. I hope I get this right said something like that this guy you know that that's what on is it's something like that i may have gotten that a little bit wrong but what he's you know when you when you talk about um somebody like Kierkegaard and nietzsche was was this way because they're both existentialists we're talking about you know Kierkegaard especially is that his experience his personal experience not crowd thinking not doing this you know religious thing because everybody else is doing and again i'm not i'm not endorsing this because i think we have to live within a a framework of a a religion but i i I think there's there's a lot between existentialism and personalism it i i think and again i I may be wrong but i'm I'm just kind of digging into this a little bit more is inserting the person into the framework of thomistic philosophy i think you're 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 in the tradition of jacques maritain uh, Jacques Maritain seemed to try to reconcile personalism and Thomism. Um, I've recently, after reading through, uh, do you, are you familiar with um, uh, what's his name? The guy who founded, uh, who's one of the co-founders of uh, Clear Creek Abbey, one of the intellectual founders. Okay. Um, John, not John Green. Um, gee whiz. Thomist. Uh, yes, he's uh, wrote uh, "Death of Christian Culture" and "Restoration of Christian Culture," and. Um, they're famous books that he was um, uh, John Senior. John Senior is his name. Uh, so the famous John I've Senior. Heard of him, yeah. Yeah. He was uh, one of the um, people of intellectual tradition of um, the founding the Benedictine monastery Clear Creek Abbey. And in his Death of Christian Culture, he has a scathing critique of Jacques Maritain. And I was quite surprised by that because um, University of St. Thomas is very much a Maritanian school. Uh, that's the kind of the the brand of Thomism that's the most um, popular at St. Thomas University, St. Thomas in Houston. I was speaking to Dr. Rebard about it because I was uh, kind of surprised. I was like, I didn't realize John Senior was so anti uh, Jacques Maritain, and he kind of made the comment to me. He was like, Yeah, the kind of rethinking Jacques Maritain. Jacques Maritain kind of was trying to reconcile Thomism to the modern world, and so he gets a lot of things that are right, but he also starts to allow for um, some modern ideas to creep into Thomism, um, which was most prevalent in his ideas of like um, his work on beauty, uh, which is very, very popular, uh, which is what uh, Bishop Barron actually uh, subscribes to. He, he, that's where he gets a lot of his ideas of beauty. And he considers himself a Thomist. Uh, yeah. Correct. Bishop right. Barron. Yes. Right. Yeah. So okay. it's interesting. I don't know. It's yeah. a, it's, a, it's a topic a, my, to jump my, my into. My is also another one, uh, very uh, mystical Thomism, but uh, anyways, interesting. So, all right, we're about to go into our trivia. Uh-oh. And uh, do you have any comments before we close out, William? Uh, yeah, I, not not like not like a big one, but I think one of the one of the things I'd I'd close out with is the going back to uh, going back to the philosophers. I, I like back I to like, the father. <laughs> <laughs> back to the philosopher. Back to the, yeah, uh, one of the things I find uh, I find interesting is the idea that 
the modern philosophers, as we were saying earlier in the show, kind of tend to go off to, you know, down the road, down the path of, is this really real? Uh, is this thing I'm looking at really, really there? Like the nominalists. Yeah. I think it, it's the it's the kind of philosophy to where I think we've gotten, like the kind of philosophy we have today that, you know, uh, this idea of transgenderism, that this, that a guy can be a woman because we don't really, because I can look at you, but I can't really know for sure what you mm-hmm. are. It's it's kind of like that idea, but you're kind of you're shifting yeah. away from the modern and the the ancient yeah. who say, yeah, we there there is there is a god and there is um, there is a there is an order and there is objective reality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that comment. Uh, you guys ready? I'm gonna ask. Uh, Adrian, a question, the, the more challenging ones, and I'm going to ask William. These are about uh, stories of particular saints. Okay? If, uh, if, you, uh, if anyone's listening that is uh, willing to come and help me out, I'm phoning a, f- <laughs> I'm phoning a friend early. Throw All those right. comments in quick. Do we have – I know this is kind of a deep conversation. Do we have some people that are still with us, or, uh, or are we – No new uh, comments. I'm looking. Let me check over um, one person watching on Facebook. Uh, five watching on YouTube and one watching on your Back to the Father channel. Oh, okay. So All right. Go. Very good. Well, to the seven of you, thank you so much for being here. We're glad you're here. All right. So I'll start with William. Uh, this one, uh, okay. This saint once challenged a Muslim sultan to a trial by fire. Uh, based. Okay. You know this one, right? You're asking me? Okay. No, 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 no. Oh. This is William. Um, okay. The saint was known for his great devotion to poverty and his love of nature, but he was also a great defender of the faith. He gained an audience with the Sultan <coughs> Al Kamil during uh, Al Kamil. Uh, the friends. time of the Fifth Crusade and attempted to convince him that Christianity was superior to Islam. Toward the end of their debate, this person challenged the Sultan to a trial in which each of them would step into a fire and the one with the true religion would be spared by God. You Amen. know this? I do. Okay. So I feel like I should you got 15 this. seconds on the clock or else Adrian can steal. Do, 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 <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, man. Was it, um, was it a Pope Leo? Uh, You're close. Yeah. Okay. Who, who, do you think really. it, who do you think it is? <laughs> it's St. Francis of Assisi. Yes. Oh, St. Francis of Assisi. Okay. So... Uh, Adrian's particularly good at this kind of stuff, so don't I feel bad noticed, if you don't yeah. get it, okay? <laughs> well, now, now, here's an interesting one. This, this, will be for for this will be for Adrian. You can oh, no. steal as well if he doesn't know it. Okay? Oh, no. Uh, now, this, oh, one, no. this one I never knew before. Okay, okay. this uh, saint once made fun of a woman's feet. Oh, Padre Pio. No. Uh, no? Oh, see, Thomas Aquinas. Should I give it to him? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you got a lot of famous yes. saints that are making fun of women's feet, or what? <laughs> it was uh, St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, the woman there, was levitating, there was, and he yeah, saw there, her there feet. There was a nun oh, yeah. in a nearby convent who was developing a reputation for holiness. Many of Thomas's brothers were taken, quite taken with her. One day, Thomas and some of the brothers went to see the nun and found her in the midst of mystical prayer, levitating high above the ground. The others were deeply in awe, but Thomas just looked at her and said, You have ugly feet. The woman stopped praying, came back down to the ground, and began yelling at Thomas for insulting her. Thomas then said that she could not be truly holy if she were so self-involved. Yep. Wow. That's yep. a true story. That's a true story. Wow. I've never heard that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, You have it, ugly feet. It's it's great. It's uh, it's very similar to a story of St. Vincent Ferrer that uh, maybe if we have time, I'll, I'll share. Okay. Lee Owens had got it. She said it was Aquinas, so very good to okay. Lee. And Annabelle said St. Francis for the first one, so she got oh, that one. Oh, so she got that. Yep. Okay. All right. Now we go on back to William. Uh, this saint is the patron saint of television writers. Television it's hard writers. to imagine this great ascetic saint who founded the order of the poor something, chilling out in the couch and laughing uproariously at a sitcom. Nevertheless, in 1958, Pope Pius XII named her the patron saint of television writers. When she was too ill to attend Mass, she reportedly had the vision of a Mass that she could hear on the wall of her room. This patronage of television would later be adopted by Mother Angelica, herself a poor, when she started what became EWTN, which today makes it possible for many people. You know this one, right? I uh, think I do. Yeah. I think was I do. Was this tw- 20th century? I, I thought we talked about this uh, with Sissel um, on the show before. Did we? I thought so. Yeah. I, I, maybe did, I maybe I'm remember. wrong. I can't. I can't believe the, 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 the Mother Angelica's order. You don't know Mother Angelica. Oh yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Well, okay, go uh, ahead. The poor Claire's. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Saint Claire. Saint Claire Vasisi. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Saint Saint Claire. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, this is going to be a, a tough one for Adrian. Uh-oh. Um, uh, this this pope became gunslinger. Got it. He said Saint Clair. Oh, got it. Okay, good. This pope became pope while he was on vacation. He he was a nobleman <gasps> and a Christian, but he was not involved in ministry or any particular church work. He went to Rome along with many others in AD two thirty six. Yes. When Pope Antaris died. He hoped to see the great sights of that venerable city and to be a part of the crowd when the new pope was elected. As the election was about to take place, a dove flew into the crowd and landed on his head in clear imitation of the descent of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove upon the Savior. Uh, According to the third century historian Eusebius, the people immediately started to gather around this person shouting, Worthy! This person was then obliged to be ordained a deacon, then a priest, and then a bishop so that he could become pope. This, of course, finally gave him the opportunity to wear his I went to Rome, and all I got was to be elected Supreme Pontiff T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's crazy, isn't it? Oh, that man. Is I, I literally there. did this same yeah. of the day not that long ago. Okay, let's, let's go to the, uh, the, oh. the audience out there. Is anybody yeah, let's see it? if anybody know it. <laughs> okay. Does anybody know it? And, and, you, and you, I'll tell you, if anybody gets this, you have stumped Adrian Fonseca. Oh, okay, that, means a, that means a lot. And it's it's a name that you know you've heard. I, I think I can, I have a guess. <clears throat> okay, come on, Annabelle. If Annabelle says there, Paul the Six. No, that's not okay, Paul the Six. Paul the Six. No. Way <laughs> no, no, earlier than that. You're off by about fifteen hundred years. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Paul uh, the Six was nineteen sixties. Was it? Okay. Okay. Fifteen seconds on the clock. Was it? Come on, man. William Gregory the Second. No. Oh. Saint Fabian. Saint Fabian. Okay. Darn. Darn. All right. Good. Darn I, I finally stumped Adrian. I All did right, the same um, other day not that long ago. I remember. Okay, I uh, name. William, this is an easier one. Uh-oh. Uh, his name is practically synonymous with Ireland. Every year, millions of people <laughs> in America. <laughs> Just jump uh, in, yeah. dude. St. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, he was not actually Irish from birth. Okay, all right. Yeah. So William is on the board. The, uh, the part of that question, okay, what was he? He wasn't Irish. What was he? In- English? British. Yeah, yeah, British. British. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. right. Um, okay, so uh, there are four churches in Adrian. There are four churches in Wales named after Saint Uh-oh. something. Almost nothing is known about this early church saint, but the existence of four churches named after him in the Diocese of St. David's in Wales testifies to his existence. He also apparently founded a monastery. <clears throat> um, you're probably not going to get this. Humbert? No. no. Um. Law Dog? Oh, there's no way. <laughs> Never, hey, it's four, ever four would have got that. After him, okay? I know. I went. To, I grew uh, up at that church in okay. Uh, England. Okay, so let me see. A couple more here. Uh, let's this see. This guy. Okay, this. Uh, I'll go ahead and just leave this one wide open to either of you. Okay. Um, this saint had 24 siblings. 24 siblings. Teresa of Avila. <laughs> no. Oh. Not all of her siblings lived to adulthood, but she was one of 25. She had a twin. She may be the great saint in the, uh, the family, but her mother clearly deserves a medal. Uh, and she was a lay Dominican. Oh, Catherine of Siena. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, his, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. And Catherine then. of Siena. And then uh, let's see. Re- one real hard one and then one easy one. Uh, and then we'll be done. Okay. Uh, this saint, um, a popular saint among the Greek Orthodox. Does he count if it's a Greek Orthodox? Um, well, Popular among them, he or was a, he was a Ukrainian only. captured as a prisoner of war and sold to what a year? Turkish Muslim. He eventually earned the deep respect of his master by his great humility and unwavering faith. One night, when his master was away on pilgrimage, he made pilaf for the family of his master. His master's wife mentioned that it was the master's favorite dish. Okay, Saint John the Russian. <laughs> what year is this? I have no idea. That can't it, be a real it, it saint. It doesn't say. Okay, here, here, here's the last one. Not a real saint. Okay, so this is go. This is for all the marbles. Okay, whoever gets this one, including the uh, all of our friends out there in social media. Um, okay, as he uh, just say it if you know it. Okay, as a young man, Lawrence. He, no. Oh. <laughs> as a young man and a new convert, he was riding across Spain when he met a Muslim who argued with him about his religion. As the Muslim rode away, he said something over his shoulder that was insulting about the Virgin Mary. St. Ignatius of Loyola. Dang. Yeah. I remember reading a book when I was younger. Way younger. I remember reading a book. Ignatius was so angry that he wanted to kill him, but he decided he would let the donkey he was riding determine if it was the right thing to do. 
if the donkey followed the man, Ignatius would kill him, but if he <laughs> would not, fortunately for the Muslim and for a lot of people who love Ignatian spirituality, the donkey took a different path. Mm-hmm. So Ignatius, I don't was, know. It make me like Ignatius spirituality a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh man, he's, uh, yeah. Ignatius. That's so Spanish of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there you go. Oh, that's awesome, man. You should shoot these scores. There it you actually go. was kind of like a tie because uh, I don't know, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but because uh, there were some neither of us. But got, that, right? that that was yeah, yeah, yeah. There were some, but uh, all right. Very well, good. there you go, folks. I thought this segment was people asking you trivia. <laughs> oh no 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 no! It, it 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 was that way a while back, but we got yeah, away from yeah. that, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, of late, it was me. It's me asking William and Cecil. It, always, it always seems to kind of come down to the wire, almost yeah. every almost single every time. Yeah. Every single time. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go, folks. All right. So is that it? Do yeah, I that, play the outro? That's it. You get All right. to uh, you get to go home now. All right, playing the outro. There you go. Thanks everybody for watching. This has been Back to the Father. God bless you. Thanks for joining us for Back to the Father. And don't forget, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. If you have comments about the show, email Dave Palmer at grnonline.com.